friends. Happy Wednesday. Welcome to The Shawnee Show. I'm your host, Shawnee Suisa. Ah, as per usual, before we dive into the episode, I do want to remind you guys to follow us, like, share, subscribe, all of that good stuff. We are on all social media platforms as well as YouTube. Definitely trying to grow my YouTube channel. I'm close to 100 subscribers, which I believe is what I need so I can make a custom URL. <laughs> It's actually driving me crazy that I don't have a custom URL on there. I am such a perfectionist with that shit. So yeah, please go subscribe to my YouTube so I can change my URL. Thank you so much. It would be great. I feel like we're, I think we're 20 away, maybe even less. I'm not sure. I have to check. I haven't looked at the numbers recently, but yeah, it's an exciting time growing. Uh, anyways, follow me on social. I'm at Shawnee Suisa for my personal account and then at Shawnee Show for all the show accounts. And this week, something that I actually did that was cool on my Instagram was I asked people to drop what they want me to talk about on my next solo episode, which is obviously today. And I, I mean, I feel like I was just craving that sort of live engagement that I used to get from the Saniac podcast. Because if you guys didn't know on Saniac, uh, we used to go live every single week. That was our, our show was always live. Our interviews were live. Our recaps were live. We were just always live. And something that I love about going live is the community that you build in the comment section. It's amazing. Like it's one of my favorite uh, parts of, of, I guess, online content is live videos. I really, really love them. So at some point, I'm definitely gonna have to start doing those on the Shawnee show. Uh, it's so much fun. It really is. And you start building a community to the point where it's not just people engaging with you, but it's people engaging with each other. You know, they're commenting, they're having discussions and, you know, they, they tune in every single week to not just hang out with us, um, like we did on the Saniac, but to also hang out with each other and to be able to discuss things with each other. So it's really cool. I love that part. It's really similar to actually Green Room, what Green Room's been doing now and what we do, um, with the UFC on there. The, the MMA content on Green Room is awesome. I think it's like their main their main focus right now. I don't know. I, I'm not on the app too much apart from that, but um, Ariel Hawani, Pizzi Carroll, Chuck Mendenhall, they have a great show with The Ringer. And the my favorite part is really the chat room because it's, you know, it's everybody else engaging with each other and it's really, really fun. And it builds such an amazing community. And uh, I just think it's fantastic. So similar sort of way um, that you have that on the live video comment sections, you have that on Green Room too. Uh, Twitter hasn't added a group chat feature to their spaces yet, but I do think that once they do, it will really boost um, just the community building aspect of doing Twitter spaces because they also have a limited amount of people that can be on the stage, which is unusual on Clubhouse. They didn't have that. Um, and I don't believe they have that on Green Room. I'm not 100. Oh, wait, actually, they do have that on Green Room. But um, but without a, a group chat, then it's really limited to who can actually speak and contribute in the Twitter space. So I think it's cool um, on Green Room. They balance it out while having a limited amount of people on stage, they still have the group chat. So, you know, you can contribute in other ways, which I think is awesome. But yeah, I miss that about live videos, you guys. I really, really miss that. So at some point I'm gonna have to do that. And to supplement a little bit of that craving, if you will, I posted on my Instagram story and I asked, you know, what do you guys want me to talk about? And there were some really cool responses. I screenshotted them. I thought I was gonna have to just make up responses. Um, <laughs> Because, you know, I mean, listen, you got to fade till you make it when it comes to content at the beginning. Uh, but there were actually some really good ones. So the first one is from Ron Smith. Uh, and it's why are we our biggest critics or getting over self-doubt and celebrating little victories? I mean, what a deep topic. The rest aren't. I mean, some of them are as deep, but the rest aren't as deep. But that's pretty um, just a pretty fantastic a pretty fantastic conversation starter, if you will. So, you know, why are we our biggest critics? And it's interesting. I was thinking about this the other day, you know, so often in social settings, we're so worried about how we're acting, but how often are we picking up on other people acting in similar ways to how we were worried about ourselves acting? If that makes sense. Does that make sense? I, it's just a really, it's a really interesting concept to me. So, like, you know, we're worried when we're sitting there being quiet and not contributing to the conversation, but when you're sitting in a big group and somebody's not you know, as loud or as involved, a lot of times you don't even really notice it because it's a big group, right? And I mean, everybody can't be screaming <laughs> unless you're in a Moroccan family household, in which case, hey, yes, they can. Uh, but it's it's really fascinating. And I do think we are our biggest critics. Uh, it's, 
Well, except for maybe social media trolls. Those are, they're pretty intense critics as well. <laughs> like I don't know. What's, what's greater, our own self-doubt or the self-doubt that the social media trolls will impart on you? Ah, but uh, getting over self-doubt. I feel like is is fascinating as well because why are we our big ex- biggest critics is more just like the concept, but how do we get over it, right? How do we get over that hump and how do we start loving ourselves and also just celebrating these little victories? And so I, th- I feel like a- awareness, both self-awareness and also just global awareness and, and perspective and being able to recognize the big picture is the best way that you can accomplish this because you look at them as little victories, but when you go out, right? And you just zoom out and see all of the people on the globe and see everybody dealing with problems and everybody dealing with mental health issues and, um, you know, financial struggles and just daily survival. And like, whatever it is that you're worried about, when you think about the fact that, for example, let's say, let me, let me give an example to this. Cause I feel like it's a little bit complex. If you're depressed, okay. And you manage to wake up one day and shower and make your bed and feed yourself properly. Those are three tasks that might seem small and insignificant and quote unquote little victories, but they're actually huge because there is somebody in your exact same situation who is just as depressed, who wasn't even able to get done any of those three, right? And stayed in bed the whole day. And in fact, maybe you have had moments in your depression where you weren't able to do those three. But today, on this day, you were able to wake up, shower, make your bed and feed yourself right. I mean, those are some serious victories. And so it's all about recognizing the fact that it could be so much worse, You know, like I know a lot of people don't like doing that. They like validating their problems and, you know, it can't be so much worse, not good to compare, da, da, da. But it's not about comparing to others as much as it is about comparing to your worst case scenario. So I guess that's something that, you know, it's interesting because I spoke about it on the podcast with Maude. This is like, you know, the reason why I am so impressed with people and I love supporting them when they do things because I really understand how hard it can be for some people to just accomplish the bare minimum to just survive on a day-to-day basis, whether it's mentally, physically, emotionally, whatever it is. So for the people who are adding on to that and not just surviving, but thriving and not just thriving, but succeeding and not just succeeding, but staying consistent, putting in that hard work, regardless of motivation, but they have the discipline. I mean, all of those things, like those are not small things to me. So when I see someone launch a business, when I see them post content every day, even if it's just every week or every month or whatever it is, but maintaining it and doing it, I'm like, wow, so, you know, people aren't even doing any of that. Anyways, it's really hard to just do things, guys. And it's not just hard for you. And it's not an uncommon thing for it to be difficult. It's hard for everybody. Like a lot of people go through that and they have those struggles and it's actually really normal for that stuff to be hard. And so just recognizing that and appreciating that you're getting through all of those quote unquote little victories is really important. You know, if you have that perspective and you're like, wow, damn. So what I'm doing is actually really impressive. Then you start feeling better. And also, again, like I said, it's not really about comparing to others, but about comparing to yourself just think about the worst case scenario that could happen with you. You know, what about that time when you were hungover for a whole week after a party in college? (laughs) Like, are you doing that now? If you're not doing that now, then you're improving. Oh, so you're hungover for two days is better than a whole week, you know? So it's like all about those little improvements, just recognizing them. And I mean, it's just slow and steady, isn't it? What was it I posted on Twitter the other day that I really liked? Um, I wrote, it's not about learning to love yourself but it's about becoming the person, a person that you can love. And who was it? Matthew commented, it's both. And I really liked what he said, because it is both. So you kind of have to meet yourself in the middle. So, you know, the self-doubt and all of this and getting over that, it's so difficult. But if you just slow, slowly meet yourself in the middle where you're on one end, more forgiving and loving yourself more. And on the other end, working tirelessly to develop consistent discipline to be able to accomplish your goals right but also still forgiving yourself when you're not able to do that and still like you're meeting in the middle 
So you're learning to love yourself and you're also working hard to become someone that you can love. And I'm telling you, once you hit that peak, I mean, you're obviously going to keep going. Like that's, that's a never ending mountain. But once you start coming closer and closer together, it's a really beautiful thing for your self-confidence and it can make you feel like a superhero, like invincible, if you will. And it's a great fucking feeling. It's a great feeling knowing that you love who you're becoming, that you're working hard to become that person and that you're just chilling out on all of the criticism and the insecurities that you had. I feel like that's the meme that everyone always posts, you know, in your thirties, you don't give a shit for real. <laughs> and I mean, it could be your thirties. It could be your forties. It could be your twenties. It could be your tens. Well, maybe not your tens. You got, you got to live through your tens. It's a little bit insecure. Uh, but you know, whenever that does happen for you, it's really great. It's also what I spoke about on the podcast with Maude, which was that breakthrough moment. If you guys, honestly, it's a long episode, but the end of that podcast is just so great. And I, I can't recommend it enough. And it was actually kind of on this topic, very relevant to what we're talking about now. And it's so good. I really recommend watching that podcast, especially the end where we speak about this breakthrough, which is the, the reassurance that you get from the world that being yourself works. And what do I mean by that? It's this, this idea, right, that you get evidence, you get proof that you can be 100% you and the world is going to receive that positively. So for me, you know, that breakthrough moment at Wilderness, that was really powerful for me. And for Maude, getting that job as a host, that was really powerful for her. And so, you know, whatever it is in the world uh, that you need uh whatever it is that you're working on, you know, to become more authentically you, once you see the results of how great that can be and how the reception can be and whatever proof it is that you end up getting, everyone has their own breakthrough moment. If you listen to the episode, you'll understand more of what I'm talking about, but it's really a powerful thing. And so I think that also helps with what we're talking about now, which is getting over self-doubt and getting over that criticism, um, you know, and being just kinder to ourselves really. Anyways, really great topic. Thank you so much, Ron. I loved that. And yeah, I uh, hope you drop more topics in the future because, you know, I think it's fantastic. And I hope that you guys all celebrate the little victories today. Like I am celebrating the fact that I have cleaned so much, <laughs> which I never stopped doing, and that I'm recording this episode, getting it done. And, you know, th these are the small victories. So I'm happy with it. I made my bed today. I love that. Um, okay. Next topic is web three and podcasting. Oh, I love this. Who sent this? Was this Ander? This is a great one. Uh, web three and podcasting is so freaking fantastic because, you know, web three, for those of you who don't know the entire concept behind it, oh, it Nick, it was Nick. Uh, the entire concept behind web three is this sort of idea of like decentralization, right? And everything being decentralized. There's a lot more to it, but the way that I see web three working with podcasting is heavily focused on decentralization. And I feel like the community aspect as well is just a massive factor. So like I was talking about with uh, building community on live videos, actually, this really ties in perfectly to what I was saying at the beginning, uh, you know, with building community with live videos, the, the way that you want people engaging with each other is exactly what you want to build in a podcasting podcasting community. I mean, that's the fucking best. Like when you have people engaging with each other and they're not just engaging with you, they're commenting, they're replying to each other, they're getting involved. That's one of the reasons why I love Beyond the Media because it's not even really, it's not even, you know, beyond, sorry, not Beyond the Media, Beyond Media, Beyond the Interview, Instagram page is, you know, they're not just replying to the tweets. They're starting conversations and they're replying to each other. And there's regular people who go in there and they talk to each other and they know each other. And so that's something that's so important. And I see that tying really well when it comes to Web3 and podcasting. And there's so many other awesome projects being done right now in the Web3 and podcasting world. Um, I, uh, I got some inside scoop into a fantastic Web3 podcasting project coming out hopefully soon. I can't really reveal it because I was sworn to secrecy. Didn't sign an NDA, but I'm just a good person, guys. So I'm not going not gonna to let you guys know about that one, but it's pretty cool. And there's some other things that I'm working on, like streaming the Shawnee show into the metaverse, into Decentraland with the Holy Ones NFT project, uh, which is just a fantastic project, super heavy focus in the metaverse. So lots of, lots of cool stuff, you know, web through and podcasting. It's just the beginning. 
uh, you have like music NFTs and stuff coming out now as well. So podcasting NFTs, that could definitely be a thing that's going to be released at some point. Uh, but I, you know, I see Web3 and podcasting going more hand to hand when it comes to utility and things like that. And also, in a sense, Patreon is already kind of like a decentralized podcasting platform to, to a small degree, um, I would say. You know, I, I do feel like it has a lot of that, like the actual platform itself is not, but the way that each individual podcast page operates kind of is. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, lots to discuss there. And hopefully I will be giving some talks about this actually at some of the NFT conferences coming up. I will, in fact, be at NFT LA and I hope to see all of you guys there. I think it's going to be fantastic. Uh, just, you know, if you see me, pop in and say hi. It's going to be a really great conference. A lot of amazing speakers. I will most likely be moderating a panel. So, yeah, hope to see you guys there. It's uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I believe, next week. Um, okay, let's move on to the next one. Thank you so much, Nick, for that. That was great. Okay, so next up is Alex, who drops something very controversial. She drops Leah Thomas and South Park in the Shawnee Show suggestion box. So thank you, Alex, for that. Um, for those who don't know what's happening right now with Leah Thomas, I will give you guys a quick little rundown, and then I'll dive into my opinion on that. So basically, Leah Thomas is a collegiate swimmer. Um, she's a part of the NCAA. The NCAA is the National uh, Collegiate Athletic Association. It's basically just our university sports thing. There's multiple divisions. There's like D1, D2, D3, D1 being the best, D3 being the least. Although th there might actually be more of a divisions. I'm not, don't quote me on that <laughs> for putting me in any stories. Just don't quote me. Uh, but yeah, Leah Thomas is a swimmer. She swims for Penn State, I believe. Let me just double check that. Oh, sorry. University of Penn. My apologies. That is a very big difference. So yeah, she's an American swimmer for the University of Pennsylvania. And right now, uh, right now this conversation is popping off because it's a swimming championships. So, but this conversation didn't just start now. I think a lot of people are just hearing about it now because maybe it's um, a little bit more prevalent, I guess, in the media. But this has been going on for a little bit now, especially with the NCAA's policies. That's been like a huge discussion for a while now. And, um, you know, now the conversation is just sort of um, coming to, I guess, a, a peak almost. I feel like when it first started, people were a lot more hesitant to speak out um, because, you know, that the, just the idea of offending people was, I don't know, I think that the, there's been a, a bigger push now against woke culture. So people are a little bit more comfortable to speak out. So that might be why the conversation is also um, sort of coming to a head, you know, combined with the fact that it's the championships. It's, it's like just, uh, I guess, the perfect recipe for it to be discussed. But um, essentially... You know, it's a matter of the, this. The question is really, you know, should trans athletes be allowed to compete against their biological counterparts, right? So should a trans female be able to compete next to biological females? And is there any sort of fair or unfair or um, just what are really the advantages and disadvantages of that? And, you know, it's, a really interesting discussion when you take into account all the various perspectives and all the different people sort of um, uh, impacted, I guess, by the decisions and by the policies of the NCAA, because while it is, um, you know, positive for the trans athletes, it's also a point of extreme frustration for the biological athletes who feel like they're just at a massive disadvantage. So, you know, it's a, it's a complicated discussion but I am happy that people are more comfortable having this discussion now because of the pushback against woke culture, because I do feel like it's important to talk about, you know, the last five to maybe, I wouldn't say 10 years per se, but I would say mostly the last five years, maybe the last eight years. The, the biggest problem for me in public discourse has just been this idea that we can't talk about things because even the simple fact of having the discussion is offensive and that's a huge hindrance, in my opinion, for my own personal education, for my own personal growth, because I really need to talk about things to be able to understand them. So if I can't, you know, feel comfortable enough to be in a conversation with someone where I might ask an offensive question, I just want to feel comfortable to be able to discuss things and to make mistakes in my conversations, to be able to make mistakes, you know, growing and learning about something because I, can, I really have a hard time learning things otherwise. 
even when it comes to just like sport or physical, like I need to be able to talk back. I need to be able to ask questions. I need to be able to, um, to, I guess, push and cause a sort of, um, I don't know, just like a, a pushback to be able to really understand a topic. I think that that's really fucking important. Like I just, I do, I, I stand strongly by that. So I'm actually happy to see the fact that so many people are now having this conversation and feeling comfortable to have this conversation and to put out a viewpoint that might be, you know, that, Hey, we don't think that Leah Thomas should be able to compete against biological females and not be scared to be called quote unquote transphobic or whatever it is, you know, in the public discourse. And the thing is, I'm actually seeing, what I'm seeing that's really refreshing is a lot of people are coming out with open opinions about the topic that are from either sides of the spectrum, politically speaking, mentally, emotionally speaking, and just all over. And, you know, they're they're feeling comfortable to be able to say what they're going to say and not be judged about. And I think that's really important. And it, it has actually shown to me that there is progress in the public discourse, which I think is awesome. So listen, we're talking about celebrating the little victories. Let's celebrate the the little victories within society as well. And this is definitely one of those in my opinion, but let's go back to the topic at hand. So really the question is, should Leah Thomas, who is a uh, male to female trans athlete, be able to compete against biological females? You know, some people are completely denying the biological differences here and some people are are really gung-ho on it. And you know, the NCAA, it comes down to the NCAA's policies, right? This is up to them. And they're the ones who have determined that if an athlete, I believe is on hormone blockers, uh, like if, if the male to female, so if you're going male to female, so if you're off testosterone, right, for a certain amount of time, then you're allowed to be able to compete. And I think that that time is only like one to two years. So it's a really short um, a short amount of time. So somebody didn't have to transition for longer. You know, I asked one of my friends, uh, Matt Belinsky, who's actually going to be coming on the podcast, uh, I believe in a couple of weeks, I'm not, I have to check my calendar, but he's coming on soon. And he posted a thing about this. And I asked him, I was like, are there major biological differences uh, when it comes to somebody who is transitioning much earlier than somebody who is transitioning later. Because one of the arguments is the fact that males have larger organs, so they have uh, b- better lung capacity, better cardio, uh, the fact that they have obviously larger muscle build, their, their skeletal build is just completely different. So my question was, do you, do you mitigate those advantages when somebody transitions younger? But then that brings up the entire discussion of should people be allowed to transition so young, right? And at what age should they be allowed to? Um, And if you put a ruling like that in place, are you then encouraging people to transition younger so they don't face, you know, issues when it comes to uh, competing as a collegiate athlete and so and so. So it's, it's like a really interesting, I mean, there's so many different rabbit holes you can go down and it's, you know, one opinion or not like one decision that you make then retroactively not retroactively, then just, it just affects everything. It's just like a domino effect. That's what I want to say. Wow. That was a lot of words to be able to just say domino effect, but what can you do? You guys, sometimes I'm wordy. Anyways, it's, it's an interesting discussion. I'll probably talk about it with Matt when he comes on the podcast, because he has some really strong opinions on this. Uh, he's pretty vocal about it. The fact that he, he dislikes, um, that Leah is competing against women and, You know, I guess I'll just say my personal opinion because, you know, I'm someone who grew up playing a ton of sports. I mean, I wasn't a listen, I wasn't like a a good athlete. I was a bench player, but I was on every fucking team. I did volleyball. I did soccer. I did basketball. I like whatever sport was available. I just I loved being on teams. I, I loved my favorite kind of activity has always been a sport you know, because I just feel like it's a group effort. It's fun. It's not like a forced workout. Now, obviously I'm into weightlifting and things like that, but it's taken years for me to get into it. When I was younger, I really just, you know, I, I working out was not an an option for me. It was playing sports, but obviously, you know, you're doing conditioning, strength and conditioning for basketball and, and volleyball. And, you know, you're incorporating all of that into it. So it was just a really great way for me to stay active, really great way to make friends. And you got to skip fucking classes. Such an underrated part of uh, high high school and middle school sports. It's like you got to miss entire like half days of school because that's when games are. And you got to go on a bus and you got to go hang out with all your friends. And it's just so much fun. And you have away tournaments. And like then I did Maccabi, which was also really fun. Went to Westchester, competed there. So anyways, I was... 
moral of the story is Shawnee played a lot of sports growing up. And as somebody who wasn't very good, who was born with a natural disadvantage, which is lack of coordination, <laughs> I can say that I personally would have been very frustrated to compete next to somebody that I felt like had a significant biological advantage over me. I would have been really frustrated about that. I really would have. Um, you know, it, it's not even like, you know, the idea of a, a co-ed, for example, uh, division or league or whatever it is, to me, that would feel almost better, right? Like that, in my opinion, I would be more okay with that then because it could be co-ed, it could be all genders, whatever you want to call it. Because then I would feel like it was an honest representation or an honest labeling of what's happening. But I would be really upset competing against someone who a, still has their, they still have their biological genitals. You know, Le Leah Thomas still has her male genitalia. And, you know, that's, you're, you're now in the locker room with them and, you know, they're competing against you, but, you know, identifying with your gender. And it would just feel, I don't know, it would just feel really dishonest being like, I'm, I'm fairly competing against this person. If it was a co-ed thing and I was voluntarily competing against quote unquote all genders, then I would feel a lot more comfortable with it because it wouldn't be like, oh, I got fifth place, um, you know, against uh, against everybody, right? Instead of, oh, I got second place to all females, but really you don't feel like it's necessarily an accurate definition, an accurate representation of it. I don't, you know, I, and it's not to say that I, like I'm very, pro people doing whatever the fuck they want right in their own personal life that's for sure like I don't you know I'm happy to consider Leah a member of the female tribe when it comes to just day-to-day -day representation right like trans females are females trans males are males that's totally fine the problem that I have is that this is not just like a day-to-day -day. NCAA the NCAA swimming championships is something that people dream of their entire fucking life and it's something that people work so hard at. I mean, you're a D1, D2, even D3 fucking collegiate athlete. Like you are a specimen. You are someone who has been training for so long. You love the sport that you're in or you're just addicted or you were forced into it as a kid and now you just are obsessed. Whatever it is, right? Like these people put their whole lives into this. So it's not just, you know accepting someone in social settings uh, and, you know, recognizing their gender identity, you know, outside in the real world. This is recognizing their gender identity and ignoring all the biological differences that come with the transitioning process, especially later on, because this is not someone who did puberty blockers or anything like that. She transitioned much later. It's only been like a, so I, I think she like took two years off from swimming altogether while she transitioned and then came back. But like, to me, when you look at her build, it's, uh, there's a massive disparity. She's very broad shouldered, super tall. It's not to say there aren't biological women who have similar build, but I mean, yeah, I just think it's a pretty blatant, there's a pretty blatant advantage. Um, and to me, that's personally, this is my own opinion, right? To me, if I was on that team and I was competing as somebody who did sports for all of her life, I would be really fucking frustrated. And especially if I was at the higher level of competition, like looking back on me when I was in high school, I didn't really, you know, I loved winning as a team because I loved watching my friends who were so good win because, you know, they were all just so happy and they worked so hard. And, and I loved winning as a team. It's like such a great feeling. But if I was in an individual sport, it wouldn't necessarily kill me to lose you know, I'm not necessarily uh, someone who's like won a bunch of gold medals out there for individual sports. So I'm not competing at the highest level. But if I was, if I was like, you know, within the top three, right. And I had a chance at winning gold, winning first. Yeah. That would really frustrate me. That would really grind my gears. It would really be hard for me to accept that. And I would feel, especially when I'm at a, you know, at a college age, my emotional intelligence was not necessarily as high as it is now. Not, you know, it's, I mean, I'm always working on that for sure. That's a constant growth point. But, you know, back then when I was like 21, 20. Oh my God. That yeah, I would, I would cry over a guy not texting me. Like, could you imagine how much I would cry over losing 
the NCAA women's championship, you know, to somebody that I didn't necessarily feel like deserved to be in my division or had a wildly, you know, obvious biological disadvantage. Yeah. That would like, that would really fucking upset me. That would really upset me. And again, not to say that I am by any means, uh, it's not to say that I, I even disagree with the trans ideology or just the process or the experience or that I don't understand how hard it would be, you know, from her end, from her perspective, I can definitely, you know, I can definitely feel both sides of this spectrum. I'm just speaking really personally for myself. If I was in that situation, if I was on that team, that's really what my opinion would be. And that's an honest fucking answer. That's not me trying to pander to any one audience or another. Like that's just a genuine reflection of myself and how I would feel in that situation. It really is. It really is. And so, you know, while I am someone who's like sensitive to causes and to people and stuff, and I really don't want to offend anyone, that's not like my intention by any means ever in life. I mean, unless I'm roasting you, <laughs> in which case, yeah, <laughs> prepare to be offended. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's not something that I'm like trying to do. And there's definitely going to be people who are going to are going to hate this, but but that's my that's my take, and I think it's a really honest take, and I think a lot of people really feel that way. You know, I don't think that there is again this pushback of woke culture has has sort of benefited this moment right now because when this conversation first started, people weren't really speaking up against Leah Thomas, and you know, as well with what was her name, Fallon Fox, I think the uh, female, the trans female mixed martial artist she competed and she fought twice before announcing that she was trans I believe was the story uh don't quote me on that either I'm not 100% sure but yeah like to me that's I mean that's crazy dishonest you know at least Leah's out but to be competing especially in mixed martial arts where it's like hand-to-hand combat which I mean really is a whole other discussion that's just like that's crazy but you know it has popped off this topic it has popped off this conversation and I, the NCAA, while their policy that's currently in place, they seem pretty steadfast on it. I actually think that they're going to have to, I don't know, they're going to have to rethink this, in my opinion. The the pushback right now from the left as well as the right on this issue has been really big. A lot of strong liberals are coming out, you know, and still speaking out against this. You know, people that really support the trans cause are speaking out against this because it is a, it's just a different issue. It's a nuanced issue. And as much as, you know, people in the last, you know, eight years love labeling things, that's offensive, that's wrong, that's right, that's this, whatever, and are so quick to judge things without actually listening to the content, without listening to the nuance, without being able to understand that there's so much more to the conversation than just the black and the white, the one and the zero, as if everything is like a binary, you know, situation, Uh, I think that that is, you know, what's, I mean, it's, it's what's happening here. So anyways, I sort of lost my train of thought on that. (laughs) Mm. How long have I been going? I started looking at the clock, you guys. I'm at 40, almost 40 minutes now. A bit ridiculous. I, I, uh, yeah, I mean, man, you guys dropped some interesting things in the suggestion box. Shawnee Show's suggestion box. That shit popped off. That shit popped off. Let's see what else happened in here. I think some of the other ones are. Oh, I didn't even mention South Park. <laughs> Anyways, there is a South Park episode. I, you guys can look up the rest. <laughs> uh, all right, let's move on to the next. So Yonatan dropped music industry, please. Honestly, I'm not going to lie. I'm probably going to save this for another day because it's just a long topic as well with, uh, with A&R and stuff like that. And with music NFTs and how things are changing now and decentralization. And there's a lot, there's a lot to that. So we're going to get into that another day. Uh, I actually would love to have somebody from the music industry on. I'd love to get Danny Bell in the studio or Danny Seth. If you guys don't know him, Danny Seth is an amazing musician, rapper, just incredible fucking human being out of the UK. He's one of my sister's friends from year course actually. And He's just, he's just fantastic. So I'd love to give him on one day. If you guys don't know his music, you should definitely check it out. One of his albums is like just one of my favorite pieces of 
of, uh, of content ever really. Um, okay. Next one was from Troy, <laughs> Troy Farkas, AKA the producer for the ringer MMA show on Spotify green room. We love them. We love that community. They are the absolute best. Troy drops in the suggestion box, Ariel Helwani, duh, which is actually hilarious because when I open my YouTube, check out what is up right now, the MMA hour, which is currently live. I was watching bits of it throughout today. Um, really some good stuff. Ariel is the kindest fucking best human being, most supportive ever. Like, you know, I know he has so much, so many controversies. <laughs> He's gone like fights and bickers and things with people, but I don't really, every time I watch them and I watch the clips, to me, that's just how Mizrahi Jews talk. Like, <laughs> we're not we're not it's not confrontational as much as it is like you know we're just trying to get to the root of the issue and he's a fucking journalist yo and he's a bomb bomb journalist and he's just great at his job such an inspiration and he's so supportive i love people who are so famous that are so supportive i think it's awesome you know it's like it's crazy it's just to me it's crazy i meet all these fucking tiktok stars in la with five million followers for just doing absolutely nothing (laughs) and i mean they're assholes like a lot of them are assholes a lot of them will you know just walk right past you not to say all of them i get along with like most people so let's just you know put into perspective but he's just a really nice guy for someone who has such a big following he's really supportive super inclusive the community that he's built on spotify green has been awesome obviously with pt and chuck as i mentioned earlier and uh yeah just love them and really they're the reason why i had the confidence to go and apply for press credentials to ufc to the so excited i got tongue twisted for ufc 272 ah because if i hadn't popped onto green room and started talking ufc with like some of the best mma journalists on this planet i don't know that i would have felt like, yeah, I can go and cover this sport, but I did and I did and I covered it and it was amazing and it was a great weekend and I can't wait to do it again, hopefully at the end of April. Uh, so yeah, that's my little aerial rant. Let's see, was there anything? There was a couple other things, but honestly a little bit useless. Oh, one of my friends on the other slide, because I put up two pages, she dropped, um, this was Anna, she wrote family court slash divorce. I think one of the teen mom people was going through something like that i don't know i don't keep up with that shit since i stopped saniac I, I really have a hard time watching reality tv i've been trying to get through the celebrity big brother season that misha tate won but it's been hard for i just can't re- i'm like traumatized from it from being in that community for so long and just it's a really negative space so it's really hard for me to uh to even tune into that shit now but uh But yeah, I do think it's one of the teen moms going through some shit like that. So she dropped family court slash divorce court. And honestly, it's such a big topic. I feel like I would need to have an expert, maybe like a divorce lawyer would be kind of cool to bring on. It's a, you know, there's a really, it's actually a really interesting discussion point within that conversation, which is the idea of um, dad's rights and, and mom's rights there's like kind of a little battle going on there. There's it's, it's interesting. Anyways, it's a whole other rabbit hole, but I've been going on for a very, very long time. Wow. So fucking long. And I still had other things that I wanted to say apart from the suggestions. Should I just keep talking? Fuck it. So, uh, (laughs) there was this one episode from Crystal and Saga recently on breaking points. It was like their bonus episode. And I was listening to it on my, one of my walks and they got to a topic about Israel And I don't think it was Sagar talking. It was a male voice, but it didn't sound like him. It might have been Kyle. I don't know. It might have been someone else. But they started going down the discussion. uh, There was some new policy being enacted in Israel about uh, marriage between Palestinians and um, Israeli citizens. I don't know what the whole policy was, but basically the, the... points that I wanted to address from what he was saying, he being someone I actually don't know because I don't think it was soccer. So someone else, uh, but he was saying, you know, how blatant, blatant it was that Israel was trying to, cause in, in the policy, it said maintain its Jewish character is one of the reasonings. 
And he was saying, you know, this is clearly like an ethno state, da 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 da. Like they're they're you know clearly trying to keep it Jewish. It's so obvious, uh, saying that it goes against the principles that of democracy, which we claim Israel has and is so strong. And he's sort of making fun of the idea that Israel is like the the uh, biggest democracy in the in the Middle East or the only democracy in the Middle East. And I mean, it really fucking is. You know, it's it's I guess it's the closest thing. Uh, but the the way he was talking about it sort of made me realize that, you know, he doesn't understand the big picture. He doesn't understand that the point of Israel <laughs> is to have a Jewish state. And I thought it was so fascinating to me because this is something that clearly I understand very well and that most Jews really understand. Like we get it, you know, we're, we're not here to have a state for the whole globe. We're here to have a state for the Jews. This is a Jewish state. And while we welcome and we have freedom of religion and, and all of that amazing stuff, there are still policies in place to like maintain its Jewish character. And I don't actually think that's a big fucking deal. You know, and I'm not talking about this marriage policy specifically because I actually do think that there are some problems with Israel's marriage policies, but they don't just affect Palestinians, which was also something that he got wrong. Like there, just because that one policy specifically spoke about Palestinians and marriage, he should have looked up whoever he was that was talking on the show, should have looked up the policies between any marriage between any Jews and any non-Jews from a personal standpoint my love of my tribe, my Judaism, my Jewish people, my heritage, my ancestry, my history, my story, and my country, Israel. To me, that's really fucking important. And maintaining the Jewish character of Israel is really actually really important to me. So anyway, again, not to say that I agree with the policy of Israel in regards to the specific marriage thing, because I have issues clearly with all the marriage things in Israel, but I also actually have issues with marriage in general. So <laughs> it's a whole other discussion that I will never bring up to my grandmother or my mother. So hopefully they did not watch this episode. Actually, I really hope my like parents and grandparents don't watch any of this. My aunts can, my aunts are cool. Uh, my uncles are cool. They can watch this stuff, but it's like, I don't want my parents hearing about anything really. <laughs> ah, I do. I mean, I love them. I love them, but then I feel like I can't drop jokes about tripping on acid and shit, you know? And I want to be able to drop the tripping on acid jokes. My mom would be okay with those jokes, but my dad, not so much. And then he's going to start talking about how I should be careful with what I say because, you know, like, it's the fucking 20s and talking about acid is bad. Uh, what can you do? The other day I put out a really hilarious tweet that I was so proud of myself for. You ever have a tweet that you're just so proud of yourself? I was like, damn, you did do that in less than 200 characters. Like, wow. You know, for somebody who's like a very long form person, when I can get a tweet down and it's short form, I get really proud of myself. I'm like, wow, so few words. Anyways, I tweeted, uh, I may have tripped on LSD, but I'll never trip over a guy. <laughs> that killed me. Oh my God, that fucking killed me. I just... Love that tweet so much. I want to relive that tweet moment for a long time, a long time, for a really long time. But I use the word LSD because on Twitter, it's full of all of these fucking intellectuals. And, you know, I just feel like saying acid is less socially acceptable right now within that space because they all like to use the scientific terms. Like, you know, you say you can't you don't say shrooms, you say psilocybin. <laughs> it's like if I'm tripping on shrooms, if I'm getting fucked on shrooms, I'm not saying psilocybin in person, okay? There's no, but I am saying psilocybin on Twitter because I am trying to blend in with the whole Eric Weinstein crowd and they use that kind of lingo. They say, God, I don't even know what the full term is for LSD. What is it? Like, acid. Yeah? Is that the, is that the, is that the right one? Should we look it up? Let's Google it. You know what, guys? Let's learn something together. LSD stands for, okay. Oh God. Lysergic, lysergic acid diethylamide. Diethyl diethylamide. For somebody who's seen so much Joe Rogan and also who's taken so much acid, I'm actually sad that I can't pronounce this properly, you know? But you're just not really learning the scientific names when you're getting fucked on acid. I'm focused on the beautiful trees outside. 
and the gorgeous scenery and everything glowing and just all of the fun and the funny. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to mark this episode not for kids on my YouTube. <laughs> I do love that there's that feature because I don't actually want kids to find any of my content. I'm not a fan of the idea of being a role model for teens, like maybe late teens, but really like I just go do like live your childhood life, you know, live your best childhood life. You'll have so much time to destroy your brain and to get into political issues and to get into deep discussions later. I think having fun is one of the most important things for a young person to do. And growth will come from that. But you really need to have fun. Like you should be enjoying yourself. You have no responsibilities. Everything is paid for. Oh, my God. I'm thinking about buying a Tesla right now. And I was like, wow. You know those people who just have everything paid for? Children. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> ah. But I do like being an adult. It is, it is a fun time. Although I wouldn't mind being stuck as a 22-year-old. I was hot when I was 22. Mm. I mean, not that I'm not still hot. I think I've had a more of a glow up actually now. But, my, but really my skin was just so good. Like I was glowing. <laughs> it's such nice skin. You don't appreciate nice skin until it's gone. Anyways. All right, guys. I love you all so much. The Shawnee Show really does mean the world to me. Don't know how to quite put it into words just yet but we've been active for about a month and three weeks now we're almost towards the end of our second month i think on april 1st or april 2nd will be the two month mark and it's just been fantastic it's been awesome to see the support and the reception and you know people saying that the studio is really well done because like i had all these insecurities that my cameras were just too low quality and it was going to be so fucking annoying but you know the truth is getting rid of perfection and that idea in my head has been so important for me throughout this process. And so I think it's been awesome to just kind of learn that you just got to let go on some things. Perfection is not going to be there. It's actually a really great way to sort of tie a bow on this episode because it ties into what we were talking about with the Leah conversation, which is just the ability to make fucking mistakes, specifically within conversations, what I was talking about before, but the ability to just, you know, n not worry about everything being so perfect. So you don't have to say everything perfectly. I don't have to edit everything perfectly. I don't have to, the audio levels don't have to be like exactly even. I can't tell you how anal I can get sometimes with that kind of shit. It's really something that I'm trying to overcome. And, you know, it can be so overwhelming that instead of producing content and just putting stuff out there, I will literally shut down for like four days because I can't figure out or do it perfectly or feel like I have the motivation or incentive to do it perfectly. So I don't want to do it at all. And like, that's just a really bad fucking mindset, especially when it comes to content creation and growth online. So just trying to channel my inner Gary V here. It's all about the content. I need to, f I need to learn how to impersonate him. I want to practice that for a day and nail it down. Cause I'm such a funny one. <laughs> He's hilarious. <laughs> Anyways, thank you guys so much. Like, follow, subscribe, uh, share this, send it to all of your friends. And I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Drop in the comment section if you guys have anything you want me to talk about in the future. DM me if you have anything specific you want me to talk about or have any questions you want me to answer. Really like engaging with the audience. It's so much fun. Today was so fun because I felt like I was really talking or specifically talking to people and I love that. And if you guys want me to do lives uh, or get that stuff going, then you know send that. Feedback is, is welcome across the board. You know, I, I'm really happy to accept feedback, especially from all of you who are listening now, because really you're day ones, you know, consider yourself day ones. I think we're only on whatever number episode here. So this is early days in the Shawnee show. You have a lot of access to me right now, and I'm really, really uh, interested in your thoughts and your takes. And I, I love reading your messages and the DMs that I've been getting have just been awesome. So keep that stuff up. It's been it's been great to hear from you guys. And I will uh, see you guys later. Boom.